I don't know if you're ages two through five, but you made your way down yet, Paul Miss Kathy. Ages two through five. While well, they make their way down, you take your copy of God's Word and let's continue the book of Mark. Mark chapter two, picking up in verse number thirteen. Mark's Gospel chapter two, picking up in verse number thirteen. Mark's Gospel chapter two, picking up in verse number thirteen. They make your way down. Ages two through five. The Bible says, He went out again beside the sea, and all the crowd was coming to him, and he was teaching them. And he passed by, and he saw Levi, the son of Alphaeus, sitting at the tax booth, and he said to him, Follow me. And he rose and followed him. And as he reclined at a table at his house, many tax collectors, sinners, were, re were, were reclining with Jesus and his disciples, were, there were many who followed him. And the scribes of the Pharisees, when they saw that he was eating with sinners and tax collectors, said to the disciples, What does he eat with the tax collectors and sinners? And when Jesus heard it, he said to them, Those who are well have no need of the physician, but those who are sick. I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. Now, Father, thank you for the display of the gospel already this morning. Thank you for this time together to worship. But Lord, as we open your word today, we plead, we pray that you will speak. You will deal in our hearts and our minds and our lives, and that you will be on them. And our lives will be changed for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, I don't need to tell you the fact is that Levi is a tax collector. Now, he's not a tax collector like sits in an office somewhere and, uh, and folks come to him. No, he actually sits in maybe a little shanty on the side of the road and he collects taxes of everybody that goes by except for the Romans. He's collecting taxes from the Jews. Now, Levi, my friend, is a Jew, but he's actually ta collecting taxes from them. Listen, they if you walk across with a donkey and had four legs, you've got four times tax with it. And then not only were you taxed going across the bridge and how many people went across the bridge, there was also a property tax. And here is where that, 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 that Levi got rich. You see, because he, he just kind of, he looked at your property and he'd say, hey, it's, it's, this is what your tax is. Now the Roman government may say it's 10 shekels, but he's charging 15 shekels because, you see, he lives on a commission type basis. This is a franchise business that he's doing. And he's doing a franchise business with the Roman government. And that's how Levi is getting rich. He is a wealthy, wealthy man. He's very, very rich. Now because of this, Levi, who is a Hebrew, guess who hates him? The Hebrews hate him. As a matter of fact, the, 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 the law of the Hebrews would say, the law of the Jews would say, well, a, a tax collector, he could not testify in court, period. He cannot judge anything. He cannot witness anything. He is not allowed to testify. They would say that he's lower than the dirt that, will, that, that you get on the bottom of your feet. That's how bad this situation is. Matter of fact, it goes so bad that Levi was kicked out of the synagogue. Now look, it, it's, a, it, it's a big deal. And it's a very high cost to pay to be alienated from all of your own people just for money. But that's what Levi did. And he's rather wealthy at it. Now all of this, all of this is going on, and Jesus comes along and calls him. All this makes Jesus, and, and the deal is all of this makes Jesus dealing with Levi a rather not remarkable thing. It is kind of amazing. It kind of blows everybody's minds that are looking around at this and they see Jesus dealing with this man, Levi. Because not only does it tell us about how Jesus deals with this man, Levi, it tells us how he relates to us. How Jesus relates to us. And not only does this story tell us how that he relates to, to Levi, and not, and not only does it tell how he relates to you and I, but I want you to listen to me, my dear church family. It, it, it teaches us how we are to relate to lost people who 
don't know Christ. Now, first of all, I want you to know this very easily in our text. I'm certain you've already grabbed it and got it in your mind. But first of all, I want you to see that Christ is the friend of sinners. Let me say that to you again. Christ is the friend of sinners. Look, look at our text again. Look at verse 13. And the Bible says, And he went out again beside the sea, and all the crowd was coming to him, and he was teaching them. And he passed by, he saw Levi, the son of Alphaeus, sitting at the tax booth, and he said to him, Follow me. And he arose and followed him. And he reclined at the table of his house, and many tax collectors and sinners were reclining with Jesus and his disciples, for there were many who followed him. Now, we already know the story, don't we? Jesus has, has been in Capernaum, he had been preaching, and, uh, and then he ended up at Peter's house, and there, 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 there he heals Peter's mother in law. And then we, we know that there's a huge crowd that shows up. So, so big, I mean, Jesus is in the house, but they're looking for Jesus, not for the gospel's sake, but just to get themselves healed and took care of. They don't want anything about repentance. They want to hear about repentance. They just say, God, they, 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 they want to say, God, heal this broken relationship I've got, heal this cancer I have, but they have nothing about wanting to follow Christ and repentance. And that's why Christ came. And we already see that, that, that these four men had faith that they could get him to Jesus. They got this man, Jesus, Jesus would take care of him. And the first thing Jesus does is forgive him of his sin and then heals him. And then this crowd gets bigger and bigger. And he leaves to Pernium. He comes back now to Pernium. Jesus now is off by the seashore. And he's passing again through Capernaum. And when he passes through Capernaum, he sees his tax collector. His tax collector, Levi. That's who he sees. And he walks up to Levi and he says, Levi, you follow me. And you know what Levi did? Levi, follow. Levi had a decisive act. He immediately forgot everything he was doing and he began to follow. He gave up his business. He gave up his enjoyment. He gave, listen, everything that Levi knew to have, he gave it all up, and he never went back to it. He followed Jesus. That's what he did. And the Bible tells us that Levi's name was changed. Levi became Matthew. He, he became the gospel writer of the book of Matthew. The gospel according to who? The gospel according to Matthew. He becomes the writer of the gospel of Matthew. Now, many believe this. Many believe that, that Simon was named Peter, which means the rock, by the Lord. So he called Levi Matthew, and what Matthew means, a gift of God. That's what it means. Matthew means a gift of God. Now, now listen, this is beautiful. You can get me this. This is one of the most beautiful things I think you can see in the New Testament. This is beautiful. This is beautiful because, because here we have, we have a rip-off artist. We have a con artist. We have somebody that's stealing and stealing and stealing, taking far more than he deserves, and he's wealthy beyond means by doing it. Everybody hates him, but nobody can touch him because he has the power and the wealth. And here comes Jesus. He takes his rip-off artist, and now he changes his name to mean a gift of God. And let me tell you what Matthew has become. Matthew has become a gift to God's people. Wow. This low life, this person hated, he made a decisive act when Jesus called him, he repented. That's what he did. He repented, he followed Jesus. And now he's a gift to God's people. It's amazing. In Capernaum, Levi was the most unacceptable person around. He was not the welcome person around. He could not go anywhere and somebody invited him to sit with him. No, no, he wasn't. He was, he was an unacceptable person in Capernaum. But Jesus saw a man, listen, you got to get this. Jesus saw a man who nobody else wanted. Amen. Yeah. Jesus went after a man who nobody else wanted. And, and that, that's, that's, that's the way it is. You see, because everybody else, here's what everybody else wanted from this man. Everybody else wanted from this man the wrath of God to fall on That's what they wanted to have to him. They wanted the ultimate condemnation and destruction on the 
this man. That's what all the Jews wanted. He's a low life, he's a crook, he's betrayed his people, he's sold out to the Roman government. May the wrath of God fall on him. But here comes Jesus. And he calls him. There was a sculpture many years ago, many, many years ago, who wanted to do an artwork. And so he got these folks to get this stone from this precious part of a mountain or a cave or something like that. They began dragging this marble with them through floor to it. They were dragging it through. When he got to the sculptor, the sculptor looked it over and he said, no, 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 no. There's too many imperfections in this stone. I'm not going to fool with this stone. And so here's what happened to that stone. That stone literally laid there for years. It just laid there. Sculptor went on to something else and the, and the stone just laid there. And all of a sudden, there was another man came by and saw that stone. And he began to look at it. And he began to just away at it. He began to sculpt it and make it. And he turned it into something beautiful. It took him two years to sculpt this marble. Two long years. But when it was done, it was veiled over. They invited folks of Raphael was there. All of these great sculptures were there. And when they unveiled it, it was a sculpture of David. It is called, you might know what it's called, you've probably heard it, Michelangelo's David. That's what it was. It was beautiful. It was Michelangelo's David. You see, here's what Christ does. Christ saw in the flawed life of Levi, the tax collector, the one hated, the one despised, he saw in Levi, Listen, he saw in Levi a matter, a gift to God's people. Amen. That's what he saw. And he still sees that today. He still sees men and women with his art style. You see, you may be here this morning and you may think, listen, I'm on the rocks of life. Nobody loves me anymore. I don't really care about things anymore. I'm down in the valley all the time. Everywhere I turn, I'm down in the valley. I'm ruined. And let me just tell you, by the providence of God, you showed up here this morning to hear about a low-life tax collector named Levi, whom God changed to be a gift to God's people. And I want to tell you this morning, that that's how still God sees people. He still sees men and women that way. He uses his artist eye. He uses the eye, the artist eye of our Father. And it's recorded in Ephesians 2, 10 when he says, For we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works. If you're here this morning and you're a believer, but you have struggled maybe with sin. Maybe you've struggled with depression. Maybe you've struggled with heartache. I don't know. What, maybe it's financial difficulty, physical, whatever it is. May I tell you, listen to me, you're God's workmanship. He's in the business of making you what you ought to be. Not what you were, but what you ought to be. Can some of you who are believers today, this morning, can some of you who are believers this morning say, I thank God I ain't what he used to be. Amen. Can you say that? Somebody ought to say it loud. Aren't you glad that you ain't what you used to be? Say amen. amen. I'm glad it ain't what it used to be. I'm glad. I'm glad that God's got a hold of me and begin to change me. Because here's the deal. God doesn't leave you alone. If you're a believer, you know Christ, you can stray, you can do whatever you want to do. But God's going to make you miserable. He's going to give in your life because He's the artist. And you're the one who's sculpting. And He ain't going to stop till He gets you where He wants you to be. See? Amen. Oh, don't you like that song? He's still working on me. To make me what all of it. Took Him just a week to make the moon and the stars, the sun, Jupiter, and Mars. How, how loving and patient He must be. He's still working on me. Hey, thank God. Hey, what are you still? I ain't always what all me. But 
But I'm looking forward to what I'm doing. Amen. 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 He's still working. He's the working chief. He is the one working. He is the one having the way. That's who God is. And Levi's life changed. For some of you this morning, you don't know Christ. You've been wrestling with this Christian faith. You're religious. You may know religion, but you've never, you've never repented. You've never counted the cost, laid it all down and followed Christ. And I want you to understand that God is putting his, putting his hounds on you to chase you down. I'm telling you what, God's going to get you. And he ain't going to stop. He's going to bring you to himself. He's going to adopt you to his family. He's calling you to repent and come to him. Make a decisive act today. Leave it all and follow Christ. Because Levi's life was changed. How do we know it was changed? In the other Gospels, you'll, you, you, it expands a little bit more. But what Levi does is he has a dinner. Look what it says in verse 15. And reclined at the table at his house, and many tax collectors and dinners were reclining, uh, sinners were reclining with Jesus and his disciples, for there were many who followed him. He has a dinner for Jesus. It's a celebration. In celebration of what Christ has done. He's so thankful. He's having a dinner honoring the Lord Jesus. It's a celebration. Now let me tell you something else he's doing too. He also throws a party to share Christ. Notice who's there. The publicans are there. The sinners are there. The guests. Or the tax collectors. The guests. Or the sinners. Now, when Mark writes sinners here, he's wanting us to understand that's how the Pharisees look at people. That's how Pharisees, sinners. And they were sinners, yes, but they forget. They, they forget they were sinners themselves. But they looked at sinners. It was a term the Pharisees used to describe those, now watch this, to describe those who were beneath them. I'm better than they are. I know the law. I know all the ins and outs of Scripture. Look at me. Look at my life. My life is moral. My life is kind. My life is sweet. How many people do you know like that today? Sadly, there's many that sit in church seats every Sunday morning thinking that their morality is sending them to heaven. They're good, moral, kind people. But they're on their way to heaven. They're on their way to hell. They're lost. They don't know Christ because they have a prideful, snooty attitude that says, look, I'm better than those folks. And you don't know that you're just as vile and wretched as they are. Amen. So, sinners. And not only sinners, but they were consorting with the Gentiles. And here, who's in the midst of it? There Jesus is. In the midst. Do you get this picture? Where's Jesus at? He's not in the halls. Of the Pharisees discussing their latest theological debate, is it? No. He's not writing a ten-page paper on how to defend how to defend their anti-resurrection or the resurrection. No, 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 no. Where's he at? He's in the midst of sinners. Aren't you glad that today? He's in the midst of sinners. That's where he's at. That brings me to my second point. That Christ is the enemy of self-righteousness. Christ is the enemy of self-righteousness. Look what he says in verse 16. And the scribes and the Pharisees, when they saw that he was eating with the sinners and tax collectors, said to his disciples, What does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? What's he doing? What's the big deal? R.C. Sproul tells a story that this lady called his office one time and said, R.C., my husband would love to play around with God with you. And I'll tell you what, if you go, I'll pay for it as a birthday present to my husband. And that's what they did. And R.C. met his her husband. And they went and they played around with God. At the end of the golf, they went into the clubhouse. And as they in the clubhouse, he saw a group of people. He saw a group of men that were sitting over here. R.C. did. And he went over and he began to sit with them and talk with them. This way, this guy made him. The guy who made him upset. These people had been coming to R.C.'s church. They'd been coming regularly to R.C.'s church. 
But this man knew the reputation of these men. He knew that they were crooks in business. He knew they were scoundrels. He knew they cheated on their wives. He knew everything about them. And it made him mad that our seed was there. So mad that he calls the church to tell on our seed. That he's hanging around bad people. That's self-righteousness. Jesus hates that. Pharisees were there, yes, but they were careful to avoid any kind of ritual impurity. To them, it was disgrace. They had never required a lay at that table with all those people and eat. By the way, when you lay at the table, it was a real serious feast. They didn't sit, they laid. At the table. But they were not going to be around all those sinners and lay at the same table with sinners. But they're asking, what's he doing? He says he's a teacher of the law. He says he's even God. What's he doing there? Wow. We turn our noses up at the Pharisees. We turn our noses at the Pharisees and we say, oh, I, I, those, those ignorant people, I cannot believe they're that way. But to many of us, Many of us live it out in our lives every day and don't even know it. We're just as far as they are. Let me tell you how we do it. We come to Christ. We come and we know Christ as Lord and Savior alive. Let me tell you what we begin to do. We immediately begin to seek out people like us. That's what we want to do, don't we? We want to seek out other what? Believers. And there's nothing wrong. The Bible tells us we ought to have a church family together. The Bible says we ought to be in a church. That's why we went baptized this morning. Hey, came in. You're serious. You're going to be accountable to this church body. You're going to be in fellowship with this church body. Yes. That's what's required. That's New Testament Bible teaching that, that if you're a Christian, you're going to be a part of the local body. And let me just tell you, if you don't, if you don't desire to be a part of the local body, you probably are not saved. Now let me say that to you again. I want that crystal clear. Don't want anybody having any misunderstanding when I say it. If you can't be a part of a church and have a desire to be a part of it and love God's people, you are probably not a believer. Because the scriptures are very clear that we need one another. We walk with each other. We hold each other accountable. We fellowship with each other. And so here we go. But here's what sometimes happens. Sometimes we go too far that we come to Christ and we seek out people like us. We attend Bible studies who are 100% Christian. We go to Sunday school where there's 100% Christians. We go to prayer meetings where there's 100% Christians. We go to small groups where there are 100% Christian. We go fishing with our Christian brother. We go out to eat with our Christian friends. We go for him. With our Christian friends. We go to the doctor. That's a Christian. We go to the dentist. That's a Christian. I mean, shoot, even all of our dogs are Christians. <laughs> right? That's how we are. And here's what happens as a result. We pass by people. We pass them by. Now, I don't know if we do it intentionally. We're just not thinking. We pass by people who need to be influenced by the gospel. We just pass them by. They're wrong. And I want to tell you this morning, listen, listen, church, have to hear me. Do you realize Katie and Ben are the only two who baptized this year? I mean, in the physical year of when we put our reports in, you know, Katie and Ben are the only two and could it be maybe we're overlooking those who are around us who need the gospel could it be I don't know maybe you are being faithful maybe, maybe, and, I, and I, I sense a, a turning to that in the last few weeks that I hear people uh, uh, start to engage in people inviting people to their homes for, for dinner who, who they don't know or know or don't know that they're Christians, who are engaging people who are lost. And
And that is what we have to do. Because the kingdom is shared through you and I. We need to reach out to people with whom we work with. We need to go to dinner with people whom we come across. We need to go play with people who are lost. We need to extend ourselves to those who are hurting. We need to make room for the unwed mother. We need to make room for that foreigner that comes into our county. We need to be people. We do Christians. We need to be the ones who get involved in our community. I grabbed this last night. We went and had a chair. I had to do a chair adoption. Chuck was there. His group were singing at the benefit, off benefit too. By the way, we raised five thousand dollars last night. I, but I was talking to this lady that I knew some time back, just picking her brain. And, and, and she was describing what kind of church she'd go to. I said, hey, you know, we're a family, we do things together. She said, well, why don't you try this too? Like an event like this. Why don't, why don't a group of the church come? Don't say you're a church, but in one on one conversation, said, yeah, we're a whole church family that's here helping this this way. See, we're involved. We're there to make an impact in the community. That's what we have to do. So the Pharisees ask the question, you know, why is he doing this? Why is he eating with these sinners? These tax collectors? Why is he doing this? And that brings me to my third point, that Christ defense of his social life. And look what he says in verse 17. And when Jesus heard it, he said to them, those who are well have no need of physician, but those who are sick, I came not to call righteous, but sinners. Wow. I came not those who are sick to need a physician. I didn't come to call righteous, I came to call sinners. It's a common sense answer. Jesus gives a common sense, plain answer to their question. Because, let's just think about it. A doctor visits who? The ill, right? A doctor visits the ill. The whole person who, quote unquote, got it together, they go to the fractured person, don't they? They go to the one who's hurting. They walk to that person who's hurting. The joyful person goes and comforts the what? The mourning person. The strong person comes along and helps the what? Helps the weak person. Right? Are you with me? You see what Jesus is getting at? Oliver Cromwell, he ruled England one time. The nation ran out of silver. They couldn't mint any more silver. There was a sudden crisis going on in the land. So he sent out soldiers to the cathedral to ask the cathedral if there was any silver in the cathedral. And the report came back and said, well, all the saints, and see they had no statues of saints, all these saints are made out of silver. Cromwell reports back to the cathedral and says, melt down, this is my quote to you, melt down the saints. Let's get them back in the circle. Melt down the saints. Let's get them back into circulations. And here's what's going to happen sometimes. Sometimes God must do that to us. We must be melted down so that we'll get into circulation in the world again for His glory. The church is for Christ. For the believer. But let's not forget it is for the world. For the glory of God. Amen. Are you with me? Amen. That's what it is. It's full world for the glory of God. Sometimes God has to melt us down to where we get active again to where we ought to be. And let me just say this to you. Does it Jesus say it? Let me say it to you. It's just plain common horse sense. That's what it is. Nothing being theological about it. It's just that we are going to find those people who are hurting and go and share the good news of Christ with me. And Christ is reading his answer. Look what he says in verse 17 again. He finished up. He says, those who are not in a position, but those who are sick. I cannot, I, 
I cannot, I cannot be called righteous, but sinners. Let me just tell you how Jesus speaks. Jesus just speaks truthfully. He just shoots it straight. You see, the Pharisees were just as needy. They weren't righteous. They were self-righteous. They weren't righteous in God's eyes. They were just as guilty as the publicans and the sinners. But here's the difference. They didn't know it. And when you come to across a person who says, I have, I have all I need. I don't need anything. Everything's good with me. I'm cool. I got it all together. You don't need to tell me anything. I, have, I, I don't have any need. Let me just tell you, listen, that person is beyond our hell and God's hell. That person is beyond our help and God's help. And here's what we have to do. I remember Greg. I'm reminded of me and Greg had a conversation about this <coughs> two or three years ago. It always stuck with me. We were talking about lost people and sharing the gospel. You probably don't remember this from the hill meeting, but I do. <laughs> and Greg said, you know, some people are just so hard. They don't need God. They don't want God. But God and His providence breaks them down. He gets them where they need to be. To where they got to be. And sometimes for us as believers, you know what we have to do? We have to pray for them in this way. All of your sharing with some of you have been so frustrated. I've heard stories. Some of you have been so frustrated sharing the gospel with some people. They don't want to hear it. They just reject it. Let me just tell you what you need to do. Just back off and pray. Let God tell God. Let God be where they're at the end of the road. And then you be there. You be there. And when God gets them at the end of the road, then they'll realize they're sick. And they need a physician. That's where it's at. That's what we have to do. But we cannot isolate ourselves. We cannot isolate ourselves from the needy world. We just can't do it. You see, because here's, here's the deal. The Christian life is a life of missions. Let me just ask you, what do you expect? I, and I want, I want to hear a response from some people. I want you to say something to me. <clears throat> what do you expect the missionaries to be supported to do every day? Monday through, Monday through Sunday. Sunday through Saturday. However you want to say it. What do you expect missionaries to do every day? Let me hear somebody say it. What do you expect a missionary to do every day? Share the gospel. What else? Pray. Pray. What else? Huh? Teach the word. What do you expect a missionary to do? But when I remind you of something, get your mind off of thinking about something that is missionaries or missionaries going to hate you and realize God has placed you in a pagan world and you're a missionary. Preach the gospel. Pray for the law. Teach them about Jesus. Amen. Live like a missionary. That's the call of the gospel, brothers and sisters. Live like a missionary. That's how it is. And I want to see something else. Second, Christ sat down and sits down with sinners. Christ sat down and he still sits down with sinners. He, he dined with them and they with him. And he, my brothers and sisters, he met their needs. We must confess. We're a believer. Listen, we must confess all known sin. We, we, we've got to be a confess. Listen, a believer is a repentant person. We must come as needy sinners. Even believers come as needy sinners. And, and, and we must say something about this. The first link between me and God is not my goodness, but my badness. Not my merit, but my misery. Not my standing, but my falling. Not my riches, no, no, but my need. You sing it sometimes. Jesus, one of the friend of sinners, Jesus, lover of my soul. Friends may fail me, foes assail me, he, my Savior, makes me whole. Jesus, what a strength and weakness, let me hide myself in him, tempted, tried, and sometimes failing, he, my strength. 
strength my victory wins. Jesus will help in sorrow while the bills or me roll, even when my heart is breaking. Oh, my comfort, he is my soul. Jesus, what a guide and keeper. While the tempest is still high, storms about me. Night overtakes me, he, my pilot, hears my cry. Jesus, I do now receive him more than all in him I find. He has granted me forgiveness. I am his. And he is mine. Hallelujah. What a savior. Hallelujah. What a friend. Saving, helping, keeping. Hallelujah. He will be with me to the end. Let's pray. Father, thank you. Thank you, Lord, for coming to wretched people and saving them from their sinfulness. God, help us to always remember we are wretched people in need of a glorious Savior and save us for Christ's sake. And I pray for those that are here today that don't know you. There may be even in this room this morning do not know you. Oh, God, bring them to a place. Call them. And help them to repent and follow you. For those who may be believers here, struggling, God help them be what you said today. We pray in the mighty, magnificent, and wonderful name of Jesus, our Lord and Savior.